Hello guys, my name is Carla. Um, I'll be speaking to you today on patient case acceptance with Propel. Um, I am in South Florida um, and it's a little bit late for me. I had a long day at the office, but um, I know that that's a little bit earlier depending on where you're at. So um, feel free to type any other questions that I'll be answering at the end and yeah, enjoy. I'd like to start by um, Disclosing that I am a KOL for Digital Smile Design. I am a consultant for Invisalign. I am KOL for Propel. I am also a line tech faculty and I am a KOL for the American Academy of Clear Liners. And I am not employed by any dental company. I don't own any stock and all of these, you know, things that we have to show. And, um, and of course, I have to disclaim that I've been compensated in the past for consulting, including with Propel. So let's just jump in. Today's lecture is not really going to focus at all on, on the science or you know much of this. Um, we're simply gonna have a, a chat on how to implement this procedure in your everyday aligner patients and how to maximize efficiency, predictability, I know that most of you know the biology of how teeth move. I really don't want to bore you with all the science. Um, but of course, we know about you know the osteoclast and osteoblast activity. And at the end of the day, basically, what you need to know is that it doesn't matter how much you push the tooth, <laughs> how much you're trying to move the tooth, if you're not really respecting the rate of how the bone remodels. So that's really kind of the takeaway from that. So, you know, also class activity, also blast activity, and, you know, really all of this science and lots of studies that supports this, but the, like I said, the basics of it is teeth move at the rate that bone remodels. So if we increase the rate of bone remodeling instead of increasing the magnitude of the force, then we'll definitely get continuous and predictable movements. So, Doing Propel with micro-osseous perforations targets the, the rate of the bone remodeling. Of course, it stimulates the bone with the inflammation and you know everything that happens in the physiological, biological level. And that at the end of the day, just basically translates into improving the rate of the tooth uh, movement. I am actually, I'd like to start I'll dive in right straight to a case. I, I don't wanna bore you guys too much with the science. There's tons of literature out there. Um, ask your reps, they have everything available to you. And I don't wanna bore you too much with that, but I'm more like um, having a conversation on how I implement this in the practice and how I communicate with my patients. So I'd like to start with um, this case right here. This is the first case that I'm gonna show you. You can see on the top is the before and on the bottom is all the afters. Um, I apologize for the quality of some of these pictures, but I'm sure you all go through this, trying to pick cases that are amazing and then I don't have great before pictures or great after pictures. But I think this is a really cool case to start off the bat because you can really see on the top right picture how narrow the arch is, how um, uh, the posterior teeth are tilted in, basically omega shape arch you can really see how that lower right canine is uh, really boxed out um, tough tough movement to do um, when you see it from on the middle picture and the before you can see how narrow that arch is and how lingually tipped those posterior teeth are and then you can really see at the bottom um, how much how much wider the arch is uh, we definitely did molar upriding on this case um, and, you know, of course, at the, on the bottom center picture, you can see the case finished with also restored in the um, anterior four um, teeth, so the laterals and the centrals. Actually, um, it's interesting that in this particular case, the reason this patient came to me was uh, for an emergency visit. He had fractured number eight, a class four, I mean, just fractured on the mesial. And on that visit, I was like, you know, I can fix this all you want, but it won't make a difference until we really idealize your occlusion and fix the cause of the problem. So I really like this case because um, not only does it show the importance of occlusion and how we need to communicate to the patients, but also 
to be able to communicate with the patients that were able to not only fix it, but fix it very predictably and in a very little time. I mean, a case like this, uh, traditionally, it would take potentially two years. So I really, really do like this case. Um, he ended up um, coming, you know, just committing right away to to doing some of the alignment. And and I, the, one of the reasons I like this case so much is because of um, the widening of the arch and the the molars and the movement that the movements that the molars did. And those lower anterior teeth were really, really tough, especially that lower right canine, and how it just falls beautifully in place. Um, this um, shows, of course, with the bite closed, and we can get a side to side. Uh, this is a, a tough case, not a, a, an absolutely perfect finish, but a patient is incredibly happy. And once again, when you're able to do this for somebody in just eight months, um, it's really amazing. And I would not have been able to do this. I mean, he has a crossbite on that lower canine, basically, and almost on the lower left um, canine, it's an edge to edge. There's no way I would have been able to finish this case in that amount of time without being able to do propel on the patient. On the next slide, I'll be showing you, yes. So these are my mops, and this is on the top. As you can see, I went all the way to the back um, because I knew I was going to be doing some movement of the molars. So um, yeah, and then on the bottom, you can see the final result. Uh, sometimes pictures aren't as good at showing um, because of the angles of the pictures I'm taking. So I figured I would show you guys um, some of the scans that we took at the start, month two and month seven. So um, of course, there's um, you know some like I said, molar uprighting, the the lower right canine, and month seven we're not completely done with the case. He actually went for an additional month, but you can really see, especially that 27, how it needed to move a little bit more. Um, fall in line in, into the arch, but it's just especially when you look at the, the picture all the way from the left and then you go all the way to the right is a pretty incredible result. He also had tooth size discrepancy, as you can see. So on the upper right picture, you can see that number 10 or the upper left lateral, I left some space there on purpose. It's really cool to see how on the upper arch, we have a pretty triangular arch and at the end of the treatment, you can see it rounding really nicely. So that's really cool. And, you know, being able to do something like this for somebody will always translate into a really happy patient, uh, the bond that's really stays there. You can see in the picture on the left is a before, you know, young kid, um, and, and you can see the reverse smile line and you can see how and why he was breaking his teeth. And then on the right, he's just super happy and he looks amazing, especially with the final touches that we did with the restorations, not only for tooth size discrepancy, but also because he had lost a lot of um, structure and that, that we had replaced with composite. And then we wait until the end of the treatment to be able to finally restore it so that it would be predictable restoration as well. So think about the bond that you'll have with these patients basically forever. Think about the referrals. Um, imagine just when they talk to their friends, friends that, that have been in treatment for years with another provider and, and they don't understand. They're like, oh, well, you know, my case was only eight months. So um, I, I think this goes beyond the science, the, the biology, and all of those things. I think it's, it's, it's mostly about the things that you're able to create and the predictability that you're able to give and that you're really able to deliver on your promise of alignment, not only to do it, but to do it in a you know, really amazing amount of time. So um, throughout the lecture, I want you to be thinking about not only how teeth move, why teeth move, why propel, does this really work? I don't want you to only be thinking about that. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you almost at, at the level of, you know, those those connections is transcends all of the, that biology and, you know, the dentistry that we have to do every day. So how do we do this? So there's all kinds of literature supporting the use of microosseous perforations, why this works. Um, like I said, you can ask your rep for, for the papers and all the research. Um, basically, uh, the way it kind of summarizes, there's a lot of um, 
clinical studies um, for NYU and basically saying, you know, there's definitely an acceleration in the bone remodeling. There's definitely a faster tooth movement and it's tolerated really well by patients and there's really no adverse events, um, you know, if you know what you're doing. So there's all some additional supporting studies um, that it protects the root and there's a transient decrease in bone density while you're doing the movement. There's enhanced aligner accuracy as well. So when you put all of this together, uh, it, it's really a no brainer. So let's talk a little bit about the different ways that we can accelerate the devices, um, the different devices, the questions that you'll usually get, um, how to do things and all of that. So it's, I think one of the most important things um, to talk about when we're talking about Propel is that it's really the first and only product that was cleared by the FDA to be able to do micro osteoperations. So um, I think when, when people ask about why not other things, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit in the next few slides. I mean, it's almost simple. Why would you not give your patients the product that's made for that and that's been approved for that? So when we are talking about micro acceleration, doing micro osteoperations, we're talking about two different kinds. Um, there's the basically the manual driver um, and uh, you can autoclave it. It has different tip options. There's the open tip option, then there's the closed tip option. There's the, um, with the closed tip option, the little plastic um, plunge just kind of inserts, uh, moves as you're going in. Um, and I used, I don't use this manual anymore, but I did use it um, at the beginning. And it's actually, it's almost foolproof. It's very easy to use. Uh, you get a lot of tactile feedback when you're using it because you're manually doing it. It's, it's really, um, it, you can really feel when you're trying, when you go and you um, basically get to the bone and you, you're trying to do the pullback. So it's, it really gives you a lot of feedback and it makes it really easy to use. If you're just beginning with this, um, then then it's a really great way to do it. But once you get started and you're doing mops on every single patient, then it just becomes incredibly slow, in my opinion, at least in my hands. And I, I definitely want to take care of my hands and I don't want to be hurting at the end of the day. So um, it's really uh, important to understand, you know, that each one has their uses. I use now the, the power driver which is, I mean, it's, you know, you can charge it. It's always charging my, in the office. I mean, we're doing this basically every day. So it's always charging. You can adjust the speed, the torque. Um, it's the angle is a little bit better for access, especially if you're going to the posterior teeth. Um, and it's just really, really incredibly fast. Um, it's, it's really important to understand that uh, the, the, the quality of the, of the tip um, it's it's just really high quality. There's I've had zero fractures or, or separations or anything like that. So basically, once once it it, it it really the way it's designed, it's just very very little soft tissue irritation, and then it just does its job basically. So. Like I said, it, it should be the gold standard if you want the best for your patients because it's really designed for this. Um, of all of these reasons why using uh, Propel to do micro perforations, of all these reasons for any, you know, you can use them for if you use braces, if anything you use or aligners, if you use, um, you know, any removal, anything that you can use, it'll help you accelerate that movement. But basically, my, my favorite reason to use this is because I am in charge. It's I'm controlling everything. So if, you pay, if your patient does not have to have any compliance, once you're, you've done this, they're done. The acceleration happens. And you know we'll compare a little bit with the high frequency um, device as well. But I personally just love the fact that I do this. It takes me 10 minutes, and that's basically it. Um, just you can 
you know, the, the finishes really get very predictable, especially at the very end. If you have like one stubborn tooth, you can always go and do a little bit more on that, just one area and it'll just go right where you need to go. So um, this is a very common question for, um, you know, because people know I do Propel and, and patients, uh, you know, or not patients, colleagues will be like, Carla, why like, you know, like that's so costly. Why would you use Propel? Just use any burst or just anything. And it's the difference is huge. You can even compare using using a, a, the propel tip versus using burst or using anything else. Uh, the the dangers and the damage that you could do if you're using a burr, you can't really control a burr on a regular hand piece. You really can't control um, so much, and you don't get the tactile feedback. So I highly, highly recommend staying away from any of that. As I said, it's the only device made for this, so why would you use anything else? You can see in that picture on the right, of course, that's not my picture. You can see how scary that is to be to, to not have control between the roots, especially on the lower anterior roots um, where they're so close together. Uh, you don't want to have, you want to have the, a minimum irritation possible. Also, I get a lot of questions on why not use uh, a TAD, and TADs are just made for something completely different. They, there's, there's, there's no. It's just not designed for it. If you, if you were to fracture an instrument, um, if you were to fracture a TAD trying to do mops on a patient, you basically just turned a very simple procedure into a very annoying procedure, if not a nightmare. So. You know, like I said, it goes back to that connection with the patient, that giving the best experience with the patient, that that being able to the experience from beginning to end being seamless and being fast and predictable and efficient. And now you just fractured an instrument in the patient's mouth. So um, I definitely advise against it. So this um, explains it a little bit more. You can really see that for a TAD, you'd have to go so much deeper to get that, to that same diameter. Um, and not only that, but remember that you, once you go, when, when, when you're doing mops, you need that feedback. So when you put your tip on your power um, driver, you really are able to tug back as soon as you feel the bone. And so you have a lot of tactile control and you're not able to do that with the tats besides the fact that, you know, there's 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 fatiguing of the steel and then there's all of that that just wouldn't wouldn't be good for your patient. So so always um, things that are usually asked, you know, where do we put the mobs? And always remember, you know, it really depends on your treatment. You are the clinician, you are the person deciding what you want to do. You understand the movement of the teeth. You understand what movements are difficult, what movements are easy. So you know that if you're doing a crazy canine rotation, like on that other patient that I showed you, you know that if you're intruding a maxillary anterior teeth, you know that if you're moving a molar, which is incredibly difficult, you know that if you're intruding lower anterior teeth, there are some movements that require a little bit more help than the usual uh, movements. So. If there's a, a case and you have some movements that are easy and there's some areas that are a little bit harder, then you can definitely, you know, apply more on that area because the remodeling is proportional to the insult. So we have more, you want more movement, then just do a little bit more. You can do it on the buckle, you can do it in the lingual if you need, like if it's a crazy, crazy hard movement. So most of the times you can get away with like doing something like three um, at the most, because it really depends on the tissue and on the gingiva. But it's it's really important to understand that, you know, the effect is regional. So if you're having a hard time accessing some areas, just remember that it goes to six to 10 millimeter radius. So basically both adjacent teeth and you can always take advantage of going to the adjacent area. So how deep? It's, it's very shallow. It's, you just have to touch cortical bone. That's it. The moment you touch cortical bone, you get out. And 
like I said, you feel the bone, you pull to talk back, there's really no need to go any deeper. And if you have surgical experience, place implants or anything like that, you have a really good understanding of how bone feels. You'll feel it right away. Um, if you don't have surgical experience, this is still incredibly straightforward and easy. It just takes a little bit of, you know, getting used to understanding how the bone feels and have, getting that talk back feeling. If you talk back and you haven't engaged in the bone, the, the tip is just going to come out. So sometimes also, um, it's really important to know, sometimes if you have a really difficult movement and the other uh, teeth don't need to move, just don't do mops on the teeth that don't need to move because they'll serve as anchorage as well. So um, that's that's really important to know. Also, um, remember that if you have a tough spot, just don't sweat it. Just just keep going. The, especially when you're doing the, the first time on a general um, case, you're going everywhere, just skip it and go to the adjacent areas. So this is just an example of mops. It depends, once again, on the kind of movement that you're doing um, and, and depends on where you're doing it. So I will usually, um, at this point, I don't really even map when I'm about to do mops. I, I just know where I'm going depending on the clean check and the movement that I'm doing. And of course, understanding your anatomy and knowing the x-rays and where things are. But I will usually go bicuspid to bicuspid for most cases, unless, you know, like I said before, you need anchorage or you need something like that. Uh, so for the most part, I'll go probably distal to bi uh, bicuspid to distal bicuspid, both upper and lower. And um, two to three, sometimes just you know one. If it's if I don't have much movement, especially on the lower interior, if I only have a little bit of movement and I need to focus on something else, it also depends on the patients, depends on the tissue, depends on many things. Uh, this question comes very often, and I already addressed it, but I want to make sure people really get so hung up on. So do I go three millimeters? Do I go five millimeters? Truthfully, I mean, this is a slide that's made so that you have some averages, but truly, I don't even measure. I mean, it's it needs to go by feel. Um, of course, it depends on the thickness of the tissue. And so people might have three millimeters. Some people with a thin biotype might have a little bit less than that. So I wouldn't really get too hung up on the measurements. I would try to look at it in a different way and more of the, the tactile feedback that you're getting while you're doing it. So let's go um, to the really basics. Of course, <laughs> you're a dentist, so you you know the anatomy and you you know the things to avoid. I mean, a big one is, of course, the uh, mental frame. And, um, but just evaluate the x-ray if you're unsure. Evaluate the treatment area. You can palpate the tissue. Um, and at the beginning, the first time you're doing it, it's it's um, just go in the maxillary area where like there's really no like important anatomy that that you, you have to be worried about. Of course, you go in between the teeth, you go in between um, in between the roots, and um, right before the treatment, you always want to do a chlorhexidine rinse. Um, you do two rinses, one minute each. Um, there's really no need to rinse afterwards. But what what you what I always do is you know um, once you get the patient numb then you always try everything around you I tested with an explorer or with a probe and I um, particularly I choose uh, to infiltrate all around um, and depends like I said depends on what target areas you might go all generally or you might just choose to do one specific area so. Myself for a full bicuspid to bicuspid in the in the upper and lower, which like I said, it's usually what I'll do. I personally only use two carpules of septocaine and really spread it out all around. And I will confess that when I started doing this, I would use probably up to four carpules. And I'll tell you now for sure, I promise you it's absolutely not necessary. If you really think about it, you're only trying to numb the soft tissue, right? So um, periosteum bone doesn't really feel pain. So I think that this part is key to the whole procedure. If you can take away something from today is that really the numbing is, is kind of the biggest part. So being as gentle as possible and as thorough as possible will get you so far and will make the experience you know, very, very easy. 
So because I said this is so important, if getting the patients numb is really not your thing, you have to get good at it or you will just really not like to do this procedure at all. Or, you know, if if you don't like numbing patients, then, then you're better off with the high frequency devices if you still wanna use acceleration. If you have any digital anesthesia devices, um, like the wand or things like that, then even better, because you know the whole thing is going to be very gentle, and that's really all you need to do, just a soft tissue. But remember, if if the patients are having a bad time getting numb, if just that part, just numbing them, it's it's a negative experience, then the whole procedure is a negative experience, and they're going to put it to the procedure, not to the numbing. Now, if the numbing is very easy and you do it very gentle and they don't feel anything, they're not going to feel the procedure at all. So I always warn them that, that even though I'm only putting a little bit of anesthesia because two car pills is really not that much, um, but I always warn them that I'm spreading it all around. So it's pretty spread out. So it will still feel very awkward because it's spread out. And, and I always joke about it, like, you're gonna hate me today. You know, like I'm giving you aligners, I'm giving you attachments, I'm doing a PR and I'm like, you know, and I'll go over what I do on that first appointment. But um, I always warn them, like, you're not gonna feel half of your face. And I promise you, it feels that way. You don't look any, you know, you don't look like you have big cheeks or big lips. You look completely normal because part of this is just how you're walking the patient through the whole thing. Uh, the psychological aspect is incredibly important in everything we do, but in particular in this one, because um, it's very rare that we'll have to numb the patients up so spread out. Even though two carpials is not that much, it's very rare that the patients will have the that feeling of being numb. It's usually one side or it's usually, you know, uh, one quadrant, but not you know, basically half of the face feels like it's gone. So let's talk a little bit about the technique. Um, I'll start with the technique with the manual driver. Um, you put pressure straight through and you can see on the picture how you're putting the pressure you're holding with some lingual support as well. Um, and then you're just pushing through and you're just rotating um, clockwise while applying the pressure. Now it is gentle pressure, but imagine rotating clockwise and rotating counterclockwise Every single time you're doing a mop, at some point your hand might get a little tired. So that's why uh, the, the, the motor, that's when it comes really handy. Now these, if you're just doing like a specific area or something like that, uh, it'll work perfect. As, and if you're starting out and you're not sure, it'll work out perfect too. But I definitely recommend having the, the power tip driver because the access is just so much easier. It's so much more comfortable in your hand. The amount of pressure, you know, of course the motor is helping you. The, the torque is high. I use my settings on high torque um, because I, you know, I like to go um, in and out as, as, as efficient as possible. And basically the way it works is, um, you know, you go, uh, you know, stop in place or start, start, stop, start, stop. And your assistant is helping you with the reverse and forward um, action. So as you're going in, your fingers and your thumb, that, that doesn't leave that position. It's going to stay in that position and your assistant is going to be changing the forward and reverse button. If you have a really well-trained assistant that's going to make it go very, very quickly. Remember, you're also engaged when you're going forward. So it's not really like you can remove your hands to, to switch um, the button uh, without hurting the patient or without, uh, you know, doing more irritation than it's necessary. So I, I in preparation of this, I've actually never recorded it, but I, I wanted to record just so that you, you get a little glimpse of what it looks like in action. Now I'm using the, the power um, driver and this is just like a little part of the whole mop because I did bicuspids to bicuspids in this area. Now, this is a very small section of the video, but it's the first time I recorded the whole thing. And to go from bicuspid to bicuspid, both upper and lower, the total video, which I started from the beginning of the mops and then I finished it at the end of the mops, it was less than eight minutes long. So 
if you have a good pace and you have a good assistant to really be able to follow the flow, after numbing, this shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. So um, I just want to show you real quick so that you understand the flow. You're going to hear me talk to my assistant and um, say forward, reverse, forward, reverse. And when I say forward, she says forward when she confirms that the button has changed to forward. And then when I say reverse and she confirms by saying reverse, you might be able to hear it a little bit. So you can really see that once you have a really good flow with your assistant, it goes very quickly. Now, this particular patient was bleeding a little bit more than the usual. Usually patients, you know, don't have much bleeding. Um, I do, um, I do something. Uh, every time I finish the quadrant, I put a little bit of gauze with a little bit of chlorhexidine and that allows also, you know, for everything to stay clean and, you know, if there's any bleeding to kind of stop it right away. So this is one of my patients. It's not the one I just showed you, but this is one of my patients. And um, by using that little trick with the gauze and the chlorhexidine and just keeping the pressure in there as I move forward in each quadrant, it really makes it, I mean, this is only five minutes after I did it. And you can see how it's just very little irritation, how the soft tissue is basically intact. That's gonna close in no time. So, um, when patients uh, get all worried about, you know, the bleeding, what they're going to see. So just make sure that they're nice and clean and just kind of warn them they're going to see tiny little dimples. They're going to go away in no time. It's all about how we communicate with the patients. So um, always, please, please, please always take pictures of your mops. Um, we save them in our patient chart. Like we take the, the pictures and then we save them on DEXIS. On, we have Dentrix as our software. Just make sure that you take the pictures and then you save them, not only for um, for treatment planning purposes and to ex know exactly what you did, but of course also for patient records and you know you just never know. Um, you you might want proof that you've never done anything to harm and you know by showing the, where the mops are, you can you can really show that you are very conservative and and that everything looked good and you were not in any crazy anatomical area that you shouldn't have been. So after treatment, so I really tell my patients, and I would say that most of my patients rarely report any pain, and the discomfort will usually happen after the anesthesia starts going away. So what I do is I tell my patients, look, you're going to have a little bit of soreness, and it's not really from the procedure that I'm doing, it's mostly from all the numbing that I'm doing because I do need to infiltrate even though I'm very gentle. That's really kind of like the, the area that's sore, especially in the upper anterior area. That area is just very sensitive. So I'm telling that's usually because of that. Um, so sure, they may experience a little bit of tenderness and a little bit of soreness uh, for the, the same day. And it usually will be right when the numbing goes away. So I give them some Tylenol. When the numbing goes away, they should be already on their system. And that's it. Most patients will say, I only took Tylenol once and that was it. Um, of course, because we do want inflammation, we are trying to stimulate that. We do not want the patients to take any anti-inflammatory, so no Advil, ibuprofen, Aleve, NSAIDs, none of that, because we don't want to slow down the tooth movement. We don't want to you know, counteract what we just did. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about my particular protocol. And look, we we all do things completely different. I I'm not saying my way is right, or you know, I'm just saying I'm just sharing what I'm doing. And I just I like to be very efficient and in and out kind of thing. I learned Propel from Dr. Anna Barrick, and when she <laughs> that's actually a few years ago. And I loved her on stage, her energy and everything. And, and the way that she was describing things really spoke to me because I just like to be in and out and then 
the patients don't really have to be coming back for, oh, now I'm giving you aligners. Oh, now I'm giving you attachments. Oh, then I'm going to do acceleration. I just do everything at once. But that's just my way, and it's shown to be very efficient to me. And I also feel that if patients are going to have any complaints or any feelings, it's probably going to be within the first week or two of starting uh, aligners. So I want to make sure that I give everything at once instead of just spreading the irritation and the discomfort. Um, so my particular protocol is I do mops on the delivery date, and I will do this on most patients, if not all. The only reason I wouldn't do mops on delivery date is if the patient is has something in particular, like I had a patient that um, had an interview, so you know I wasn't gonna numb her, and then she was gonna go for an interview. That's kind of the only thing I can think of. Um, so on that same day, so the patients come for for the first visit for an aligner delivery. So we place our attachments. Of course, we went over the clinic check and we were over everything. We reviewed everything together. Uh, we'll do the chlorhexidine rinse. We'll have the patient, you know, numb. And as I said, two carpels of septocaine, bicuspid to bicuspid, upper and lower. I know that for some of you that might sound perfectly fine, but I've talked to so many people that tell me that's just not enough, that how can I spread it out like that? I promise you just try to spread it out. Look at the carpel, upper right half carpel, upper left half carpel. Of course, you can always strengthen it if you need to. Um, then I do my mops with my power driver. And as I explained earlier, I, um, you know, I put a little bit of gauze of, with chlorhexine on each quad that I'm finishing. Um, after I do the mops, I'll do my IPR uh, because I am leaving the gauze with the chlorhexine and then I protect with the cotton too. So I feel like I'm giving it a little bit more time for, um, for the bleeding to stop if there's bleeding. Um, then I instruct the patients to do five or seven day changes, and it really depends on what type of case, of course, what type of movements. And like I said, if there's some crazy rotations, crazy intrusion, molar tipping, things like that, then I probably stick to something like seven days. But if we have some really straightforward, predictable movements, um, you can do five days. Some people even do three day changes, especially if you use high frequency devices like the VPRO5 with the MOPS. Another really important thing while you're doing the procedure, so of course, like I said, the numbing part is really important, but while you're doing the procedure, you know, have some music on. I always have a little bite block, just a little one because you don't need them to be open so much, but that helps them relax and just not have to open themselves. I always have the low speed suction on, on that bite block because it helps drown a little bit of the noise of the vibration of the power driver. Um, and I think that's important psychologically for them to just be as disconnected as uh, they can from what's going on. So they might not be feeling the pain because you numb them up, but the sound is just not nice. So uh, the other thing that, that I do is um, after they're all numb, because I numb everything up at once, um, I will do a test. I, I'll, I'll test to make sure that they're numb and I'll do one. And I'll tell them, okay, I'm going to do one, and now I want you to understand what you're going to feel so that you know what to expect. Managing expectations is everything. If you show them slowly what it is, and then you tell them, okay, so that's what you'll be feeling for the next few minutes, it really brings that anxiety level down. Let's talk a little bit about patient communication. And, and like I said, I want this to be a little bit beyond just the biology and why we're doing this. Um, I want this to go more in terms of the experience and, and patient acceptance and, and why it's so easy for some people to get patient acceptance. And I get so many people that tell me, it's like, you know, my patients are afraid of it. I don't even know how to tell them. And, or, you know, whenever I explain it to them, they say, no way, I'm not going to have that done in my mouth. So make sure that you avoid using scary words or making it a big deal. I mean, think about it, like just saying drilling into bone sounds completely awful. And I know, and I'm not joking. I mean, this is how some people talk to patients. And let's say you don't do it yourself. You don't tell the patients that, but maybe the assistants or maybe your receptionist or part of your team or the hygienist, maybe they don't understand how to explain to the patients um, what it is. So make sure that everybody's on the same page. I usually offer it as an option. I never say this has to be done. 
but a highly recommended one. And I'll tell you that almost 100% of my patients say yes. Um, I really, you know, I don't make it a big deal. I always tell them, you know, uh, during the consultation for this line, I'll tell them, so we do a procedure that can help you increase the predictability of your treatment and decrease the treatment time in half. Would you be interested in knowing a little bit more about that? And um, everybody will say yes to that. And now it's up to you on how you communicate this to them. Um, the acceleration versus stimulation. Um, I think this is important and I, I do want you to pay attention to this. Some people will tell you, oh, I don't care how long my treatment takes. So you need to manage that because you, the doctor, will always want to do this procedure because you're increasing predictability, you're decreasing chair time, and of course you want to be in and out of the treatment and deliver what you promised as soon as possible. So when I talk about acceleration, I actually don't use the, the, the stress on the acceleration part. I talk a little bit more about the increase of predictability. So I'll tell them it's not only the speed, I don't, even if you don't want it to be fast, it's not the speed, but the fact that the predictability is increasing. So in those patients, I will tell you that, I'll tell them it's more like I'm stimulating the movement of the teeth. They're really stuck where they are and they really, you know, we want them to get them right from the start. We want them to get to move. So it's really important to train your team to have the same exact language as you do. It's incredibly, incredibly important. I mean, they can definitely, I mean, your team can make or break this. You could have you could have downplayed it to the patient. You could have gotten a patient acceptance. And then, you know, they get called to confirm the appointment. And it's like, oh, so what's going to happen? And it's like, well, they're going to do, they're going to give you aligners. They're going to put your attachments. And then they're going to drill into your bone to do the acceleration. And that could totally break the, the fact that the patient accepted treatment. So um, talking about scary things, I I... I want you to, to be really careful with the consent that Propel gives us, which is the one I use truthfully, but man, that consent is scary. It's a really scary consent. So just make sure that, you know, they're signing the consent while they're out in the operatory in the presence of a team member or you, be sure to appease them, you know, you know, that's just stuff that we sign. It's never happened to me. It's very rare because some of the things that it says there, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty scary. So. Remember, downplaying, uh, not making a big deal of the procedure, communication is key. Team members being on the same page with the same language is huge. And, you know, um, when they want to know a little bit more information, if that's not enough um, information, like a procedure that helps you increase predictability and decrease the treatment time, then when they want to know physically what it is, I'll tell them, look, um, it's a procedure where you will feel a little bit of vibration all around the teeth that we want to move. Uh, some numbing is required, but it's pretty superficial. I don't really even have to use that much. It's gonna feel like it's heavy, but it's really not that much. And I think the way that we talk to patients, not only about this procedure, but about everything, it's huge. Now, it doesn't matter. You can't really talk to the patients like that if you don't feel it yourself. Or you could, but the patient is going to see right through it. So it's really important to understand that. Um, I've had some patients <laughs> that were perfectly fine with, um, you know, the, the treatment. They were excited about it. And then they checked it out on, online. They Googled it and they saw what the procedure was. And now they're super anxious and they do not want to have it. I, you know, it's, it all comes down to the connection with your patients and how, and your bedside manners. It's never been a huge issue, but definitely you have to do some damage control if they've seen the procedure um, on video, because even that like one minute video that I showed you for people that don't know or don't understand it, it can be a scary thing. You know, it's literally a drill going through the gum inside of the bone. So I, I do think um, it's really important to, to understand how to manage when people have seen what the procedure is like. Um, that's why I don't make a big deal out of it during the, during the consultation because it really isn't a big deal and I don't want them to, to try to find uh, answers or something that they weren't clear. So I try to answer all their questions during the consultation as well. So um, like I said, give the consent in, in the operatory so that you're ready to answer all the questions. Uh, throughout the procedure, communicate with the patient at all times. You know, you do a little bit, are you doing okay? 
uh, you will feel some vibration and some pressure. You're not supposed to feel anything else. Please let me know if there's anything else. Uh, like I told you guys, I always do a test side. I do the first one. I tell the patient, okay, you feel that? Nothing, right? Okay, so that's what you'll be feeling in the next 10 minutes. Um, the idea of what we're doing is so much worse than what it really is. But like I said, you have to believe it yourself first, because if not, the patients are going to see you right through it. Let's jump to another case, and this is a pretty easy case, but I think it's always powerful to show patients. So this is a very simple case. Like I said, it only took three months, and truthfully, it could have been less than two months. This was at the very beginning when I was doing Propel. I didn't do Propel uh, on the first appointment. The patient had some appointment or something, and we didn't do it, and then she called back wanting it, like, and she came two weeks after. Looking at this case, I really think knowing what I know now and the kinds of movements that I do, I really think we could get away with something like a month and a half. And the reason why this case, even though it's easy, it's important, is because we all have these patients all throughout our practice. And this is a really young patient, gorgeous teeth. Notice the chip on the upper right central, the wear on the upper right lateral. Um, and you can really, this is like almost that token case where you show the patients, look, you're really wearing your teeth, it's especially if it's somebody that's worn their teeth a lot. You're wearing your teeth a lot, and this is, you need to fix everything, and then we can conservatively just do a little restoration, and, you know, it's, it's really straightforward. So what's in it for you? What's in it for me, for the doctor? The, the patient benefits are obvious, but for you, of course, less chair time, more predictability, higher compliance, definitely more referrals. Avoid the longer treatment and patient burnout. I think the, that that limit is almost like at the 10 month, the patient starts just not being as compliant. You can always get a, paid more with an additional fee, even either if it's insurance or a private fee. Um, and it really, you know, kind of helps you with some of the types of cases that you do. Um, and I'll show you my first case. This was my very first case that I did with Propel. I apologize for the quality of the pictures above. It was a really long time ago. But I think it's really important to see that I am not claiming this case to be a perfect case. It's a really, really tough case. That canine is just like, for anybody, it's just really, really difficult to put into place. Notice how the other canine on the upper right is actually in crossbite as well. Um, so having this tool in your tool belt also helps you do things you probably would have passed on. Um, and this case I did with a manual driver because it was my very first case. And um, notice how, how the key to everything is communication. This patient and I, would both knew that upper left canine was a big challenge, regardless of what modality of treatment was. The patient was super open to it. So this is a really good example of the use of MOPS, not only for acceleration, but also to, to make some things possible that you probably wouldn't have been able to. I'm really sure, I'm sure, I couldn't have gotten that, um, anywhere close to this without acceleration. I will kind of skip through the, the high frequency vibration um, devices. Um, just know that it's definitely, you can, uh, if you're doing it at adjunct to MOPS, you can really go to like a three day change. It reduces treatment time and also stabilizes um, after. It's a really cool trick to be used to use it for relapsed patients. Um, you can put the retainer and just either do MOPS or do um, high frequency vibration, um, like a VPRO5, and then everything will sit right in place. Like I said, I'm not going to go into much details. This is what the device looks like. Um, the bone remodeling increases and the retention of bone density increases as well. Um, this is what it looks like, and it comes with a little cool app. Um, I'm going to finish with the last case. Um, and this case only took eight months as well. But I want you to notice before you see, I want you to notice how those laterals are just really, really tough. They're just completely rotated. They're tiny. So you have very little contact of the aligners with the laterals. And um, it's just really cool that when we have a little bit of help, then you can really get to a much more desirable position, especially when you're planning restorative. So this was a pre-restorative case I was going to restore this patient, but I didn't want to restore in the position that was on the top. Notice how the deep bite has changed so much. 
and it's just overall it's just a really really cool way to to really be able to give the patients not only the fact that it happened but the fact that it happened in such a little amount of time if you really think about it traditionally um in probably in my hands this would have taken me probably a year and a half um if not more so of course a very compliant patient uh, with the with the help of mops on this particular patient, especially on the laterals, I did do two rounds of mops. And it's just really cool when you do a progress assessment on the kinds of movements that you're expecting um, to really see those laterals green, right? Which means like we're right on track, we're right where we need to be. So it's just really cool. And it talks about not just the speed, but of course the predictability, like I've been saying the whole time. And this is just really cool. Like I said, pictures sometimes aren't as good. So this is the scan before we started. Notice the amount of the crowding on the bottom. Notice those laterals. Um, notice how everything just slowly falls into place. And now I'm ready to be able to do restorative on this beautiful patient. So just to summarize, um, you know, she has class one deep bite, um, tooth size discrepancy. Uh, moderate to severe crowding, those those laterals just tough. Um, I use clear aligner, uh, clear, clear aligners, and I did uh, mops uh, twice on this particular patient. And like I said, eight months to align and then restorative, a little bit of whitening, and it's like magic happened. So Let's talk about some key things to take before I read through all this. I want to make sure that you understand that the, the purpose of my presentation is mainly to kind of take you through the, the psychological part, the experience of getting the patients to accept a, a treatment modality that is so incredibly beneficial, that is really, truthfully, not a big deal. That is an easy procedure for you to learn and, and become an expert at. So, so the taking you through this psychological part of it is just really important. Um, take you and the patient. So to get used, like you know, don't don't psych yourself out of it, and don't psych the patient out of it, because that can that's something that we can do very easily with a lot of procedures. But there's something about this one, especially with that consent. So choose your words wisely when you're communicating um, the, the procedure. Remember, it's a little bit of vibration, a little bit of pressure. Communicate throughout the procedure with the patient. Communicate really well before, during the consultation, and don't make a big deal out of it. Um, just practice and get really confident with the feeling of it, you know, like the feeling of getting to the bone and then, um, you know, the talk back and getting out so that you can do it fast and, and be precise with it. And that way, the more comfortable you feel, then you can really transfer that confidence to the patient. I promise you it's very, very easy to do. Very easy to do. Just You just know your anatomy and truthfully, you don't have to know that many details. Just know where the mental foramen is. Um, the rest is you know, pretty easy. Um, it's usually easier on the maxilla due to the bone density of the maxilla. Um, and it, of course, it depends on some patients. Some patients have crazy bone density you really have to like you know have some lingual counter um, force to it but um in general you know just go in a specific angle you can go in a 45 degree angle and then like kind of turn your tip once you engage you're in and then you just get out um so that's why some cases are easier um, than others be very aware of any contraindications so of course radiation bisphosphonates um, anything that can, you know, that can be systemically compromising the patient for it. Um, if the patient has, uh, is a very anxious patient and you don't think they'll be comfortable with being numb, that feeling of numbness, even though it's superficial, it's, it, it feels like half of your face is gone. If you feel that you have a patient that will be too anxious through it, just don't do it. Just definitely use an appliance, use a V-Pro5 and, you know, you'll get the same just need to trust the patient for compliance. Um, very important, this is part of that psychological factor. Don't let the patient walk out if they're still bleeding from the mops. I mean, it gets on the trace, it, then they're bleeding everywhere. It just doesn't, it makes them feel like you did a whole lot more than you what you actually de did. Team training is really, really big. 
Um, if your assistant knows your steps, the forward, reverse, like going, like knowing where you're walking, knowing when to put the complexity in gauze, knowing when to change your pipe clock, uh, 10 minutes is too long. You know, if you have somebody that can really do the dance with you, then you'll definitely do it in no time. You really think about it. Um, numbing takes you what? Maybe maybe three minutes because you're gonna be gentle, three to five minutes if you wanna give it a little bit more time. Then uh, of course, make sure that you dry the mucosa, put topical before you numb. That's a, another big one. But if you really think about it, something that takes you 15 minutes can make a world of a difference in your, uh, in your case. Uh, most of my patients actually recommend it to their friends. They'll be like, oh, your dentist doesn't do that? Your doctor doesn't know how to do this? So it really gives you like almost like an edge to it. Um, definitely play some music, have fun um, while you're doing it. Uh, you know, like I said, put the low speed suction, put some music. I think the noise is more annoying than anything. So the music and everything else makes the appointment go really, really fun. So I hope this was um, beneficial to you and how you're communicating this treatment modality to your patients. Um, I hope it was beneficial in getting you more comfortable with it. And like I said, if you practice and you feel comfortable with it, it's just naturally going to flow to the patient and it's going to get them excited to do it. So um, I am open to any questions that you guys may have. Hope you enjoyed it. Feel also free to, you know, send me an email or, uh, you know, Instagram or anything like that. Any questions? Let's see. Come on, guys, don't be shy. Questions, questions, I'm open for questions. One second, I'm trying to get to them, but I don't see the questions. Give me one minute, guys. I hear there's a bunch of questions, but they're not showing up on my screen. Hi, Dr. Soto. Let me uh, let me read them out for you. Okay. So Perfect. the first question that we have here is: When doing your mops, do you try to keep them in attached tissue only, or will you place them in the unattached tissue as well? So it really depends on what kind of movement I'm trying to achieve. I mostly try to stay in attached gingiva, but if there's a really tricky movement that I really wanna get as much as possible. I try to tug the tissue back and with the driver it's much easier to just try to you know, tug the tissue back and put some pressure, apply some pressure so I can do the mop even if it's not an attached gingiva. Great, uh, next question here is, do you charge extra for acceleration? So I do, for the most part. Um, I will, if it's a regular case, I, I do say that it's optional and I recommend it and that there's a small additional fee to it. The fee ranges into something like $300 to $500. Um, if there's a case that I really, really want to do, then I just add it as almost like an added value to the treatment because then, you know, we're also trying to find ways to differentiate. You can also bill to insurance. Um, your rep will give you not only the codes, but the narrative. So what my um, office manager does is she sends the narrative 
and um, the codes, the narrative, and the pictures of the mapping after. And I, I, I mean, I've seen some really nice insurance reimbursement, um, anywhere from three hundred dollars to maybe a thousand or more. So it really depends on the coverage, the insurance, and the you know all of those things that I'm not an expert at. But um, you can definitely build to insurance, and if they cover it, um, it's great. And that also helps you with the ortho too. If you're trying to help the patient out, then this is this added value helps you play a little bit with the ortho fees as well. Next is how but often... I've also, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, but I've also ahead. not charged. I've also not charged as well. If I just really want to do it and, you know, just want to get the case through or if it's somebody that didn't, um, you know, I wasn't doing it when I started the treatment and then, uh, you know, earlier on I started doing it, I would just do it to get my case, you know, my case finished. Sorry to interrupt that. Yeah, no, of course. Okay. Great. Um, next is how often is the MOP performed during ortho? So I always do it on the first appointment, and for the most part, that will be the one time. On very difficult cases, and I showed two moderate cases, um, especially some specific movements, uh, like those laterals on the last case and the, the first case with the canine that was boxed out. Um, on those cases, I did it twice, but I've never done it more than twice. And so I'll, the, the effect will last for approximately 12 weeks, and especially if you're doing V Pro 5, it, it might last a little bit longer. Cool. So next is can you feel when you hit teeth? Um I've never that uh that I know of, I've never hit teeth. I have, would assume you can. I am very very used to, I mean, I place implants. I've been placing them for 13 years. I know exactly what bone feels like. So to me, it's pretty much second nature the way it feels, but I think that you would know. I mean, if you really just imagine almost you should practice with, you know, like an extracted tooth and the way that feels, it wouldn't go in easy at all. You would really have to push. And when you're going into bone, you're not really putting that much pressure. So I would think you would be able to feel it, but like I said, that, that tactile feedback is incredibly important. Next is, can an implant motor be used with Propel? That's a great question. I actually uh, will <laughs> confess that I did use it for a few times before I bought the motor. It can be used, it's just not as smooth. And what I noticed is that uh, my mops weren't as clean as they are with the driver. So you can certainly use it, just find your torque and find what, you know, what you're comfortable with. You have to find your own settings and you can certainly do it. I just, it wasn't as clean and as easy. And then the reverse mechanism takes longer in an implant motor. You like hit the pedal and then it's like starts beeping and then you go back. Uh, the mechanics of it is just not as comfortable as having it all in your driver, but it's, I mean, I am, I'm sure that um, these words are not endorsed by Propel. I'm just being very authentic. I used them for a few cases and they, it, you can do it in a case of an emergency and I will do it in a case of emergency, but you can't really compare with like the clean cut and then how, how practical it is with the driver. Next is, I know it'd be less effective, but would it be worth doing it if we do not have the Propel equipment in our office? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, um, I think that uh, the question is like, would a laser be capable of doing mops? Um, depends, I mean, if it's a soft tissue laser, no, because you do have to penetrate uh, the bone, you have to get right to, to the bone, so I don't think so. Uh, next is, do you go deeper with the tip if the PT has bony exposures on the buckle? Um, that's a really good question. I have, I, you just go in a little bit deeper just because you know that you have all that bone and you almost naturally go in a little bit deeper. I do think that the actual effect um, is spreading throughout and remember that it has six to 10 millimeters of the effect spread all, you know, all angles. So in terms of the effect that it'll have, I don't think it makes that big of a difference. Um, and remember that's gonna be more apical too. Uh, you're still gonna getting close once you get closer to the tooth and the coronal aspect. 
Okay, that seems to be the end of our questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.